running as a reformer. He was elected the mayor of Buffalo, New York in 1881, the governor of New York in 1882, and president in 1885. Cleveland appealed to the middle class voters of both parties as someone who would fight political corruption and big money interest. When he ran for re-election in 1888, Republicans had raised lots of money from the nation's manufacturers and spent it lavishly helping to ensure the victory for Benjamin Harrison. Cleveland did win the popular vote, but he lost in the Electoral College. And his wife said, as they left the White House, take care of this house, we'll be back. <laughs> and in 1892, with Adlai Stevenson as his vice president, he quashed the re-election of Benjamin Harrison. But during his second term, Cleveland had to deal with the most severe depression that the nation had ever suffered, with 18% unemployment. Cleveland will be remembered for protecting the power and autonomy of the executive branch. His record-breaking use of the presidential veto earned him the deserved title of the Guardian President. Hardworking, honest, independent, Cleveland had no real vision for the future. At most, historians tend to see his presidency as strengthening the power of the executive branch in relation to Congress. 1887, he retired to Princeton and was treated like royalty. He became a trustee of the university. He wrote essays and political commentaries. He died on June 24th, 1908. His last words, I have tried so hard to do right. Teddy Roosevelt's eulogy compared him to a happy warrior, one who has served on honorable terms and who understood that the presidency was a public trust bestowed upon him by the people. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Liz Lempert had um, I've had the honor of speaking at this annual wreath-laying ceremony for President Cleveland for the past several years. It's a time to reflect on his legacy, on how he stood for honesty during a time of opportunism, how he took on the patronage system, the, his own party bosses, and political graft. While we don't coordinate um, our remarks ahead of time, um, I've assumed that um, other speakers today will talk about Cleveland's presidency but as I normally do, I'd like to use my time to talk a bit about Grover Cleveland's special relationship with the Princeton community and his life post-presidency. President Cleveland was invited to visit Princeton during the end of his second term, right before the election of 1896. It was a difficult time in Cleveland's presidency. The country was still reeling from the panic of 1893, and the economy had plunged into a national depression. He was at his most unpopular. The Republicans were attacking him and his own party had abandoned him. It was at this moment that Cleveland came to Princeton for its sesquicentennial celebration. As part of the festivities, there was a torchlight parade. Thousands of people showed up, townspeople, alums, professors and students, President Cleveland had a prime spot in the reviewing stand, which had been set up in front of Nassau Hall. The building was lit up by electric lights, um, and they were orange, and the whole thing was very high-tech for the time. The entire parade route was lined with glowing orange lanterns. Each class marched in the parade, starting with the alumni class of 1839, 
followed by the class of 1840, all the way up to the current students. And as each class passed President Cleveland, they gave him the Princeton locomotive cheer. I'm not sure if this was the first P-Rade, but um, I think uh, some of us who've been here for that will recognize the scene. President Cleveland was completely taken by this outpouring of affection for him. He fell in love with our town on the spot, the beauty, the magical parade, and the warm welcome he had received, and decided to move here after he retired from the presidency. Once Cleveland settled here, he immersed himself in university life and town life, threw himself into the prime local land use dispute of his day, which was where to house the graduate school, near the undergraduates, at the center of campus, or on the edge of campus in a more bucolic setting. President Cleveland sided with the graduate school dean at the time, Dean West, in wanting the graduate college built on the edge of campus. The opposing camp, who wanted the graduate college next to the undergraduates, was led by the president of the University of the time, future president Woodrow Wilson. I personally love the image of these two U.S. presidents locking horns over the campus plan. Needless to say, President Cleveland ultimately won that fight, and the tower of the graduate college building is named after him. My colleague Tim Quinn reminded me that Grover Cleveland's wife, Frances Folsom, gave one of the founding gifts of books to the Princeton Public Library, another exceptional institution that makes Princeton so special. Today, as we lay a wreath for Grover Cleveland, we remember him as a president and also as a man and as a Princetonian. Princeton welcomed Cleveland when he was down and in return, Cleveland and his family gave back to Princeton in so many lasting ways. We are proud to be Grover Cleveland's adopted home and resting place. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the President of the United States, we would like to thank the Princeton community for their support of this military observance, and thank you all for your attendance. Good day.